Hello everybody and welcome to the Growing Pulses in 2020 webinar series with today's webinar on inoculation and nodulation of pulses. My name is Amy Howard and I work with the Birchip Cropping Group on the GIDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability opportunities. Now, before we start this webinar, everybody should be muted. We'll take questions after the presentation and the Q&A window at the bottom of your screen allows you to ask questions. So if you see a button for Q&A, if you click that, you can open the window, type your questions into the box and hit send. You can also check send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to your question. This webinar is being recorded. If so, if you can't stay for the entire webinar, or if you have any technical issues or would like to share this, the recordings will be made available on the GRDC YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Let's get straight into today's presentation. I'd like to introduce you all to Ross Ballard, who is a senior scientist at SADI and, work, and has worked on a range of pulse and pasture projects over the past 30 years, and has contributed to the development of several commercial inoculant strains and currently leads the nitrogen fixation program for the GRDC Southern Region. Thanks, Amy. Um, so I'll just uh, get started here. And um, I'm going to cover four areas in this brief uh, presentation. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview um, generally about rhizobium nodulation and infixation, just to set the scene. Then I'll, I'll talk about some of the, the key stresses that, that are, affect inoculation success um, and also nodulation more generally in the field. Um, I'll briefly touch on some of the different inoculation formulations um, and, and some of the work we've, we've done to show the benefits of inoculation rates and then finish just by you know, looking at um, some developments um, that may interest you in the future. Um, so just to begin with, um, some background around rhizobium nodulation and end fixation. And we always just start by um, um, a quick summary of the different inoculation groups. So you're looking at a table um, of the main inoculation groups and, and we'll be looking at the, the pulses today, which are the ones highlighted in yellow, blue and orange. And I guess the thing to take home here is that we still see some confusion about inoculation groups and people using the, the, the wrong groups on the wrong legume. So it's important to realise that um, these different groups are there for a reason. It's because they're specific to the legumes. And so the two groups, E and F, um, that they nodulate field pea, vetch, lentil and, and farber bean. And those two tend to be interchangeable. It's, it's the one species, Rhizobium leguminosarum. And so commercially, most of the manufacturers are producing group F these days, and that can be used across those, that group of legumes. Um, I guess because those legumes are being widely grown, many soils contain um, those Rhizobium already. Um, and so um, in soils with a, a history of those legumes that are neutral in pH, often they already contain those rhizobium. You've got the group G rhizobium, which is specific to lupin and the pasture legume cerebella. Um, it's a slower growing species that has better acidity tolerance in soils. And it, where lupin and cerebella have been grown, it, it tends to also assist in the soil. And then you've also got the group in um, chickpea group, um, which is a totally different rhizobium again. Um, but because chickpeas in southern region have been um, less widely grown, um, what you tend to find is most soils, um, or, or the majority of soils, are still responsive to chickpea um, inoculation. Okay. So one of the questions we commonly get is how many nodules do, do we need on a legume crop? And I guess the, um, um, a simple comment is that if you've got no nodules, you don't get any end fixation. But what a lot of people um, tend to think is if you've maybe got four or five nodules, that's adequate. And in fact, our experience of the pulses, and particularly in pea and bean, um, indicate that you probably need around 50 nodules 
um, to have um, a good chance of maximising the, the level of end fixation. So the slide you're looking at there is just a picture of um, a field pea on the, the left and a, a barbel bean on the right, and, and they would have upwards of 50 nodules on them. And those two plants are about six weeks old, and that's generally when we assess nodulation in that six to eight week period, gives enough time for the plants to form nodules. Um, um, but also at that point in time, they're easily pulled out of the ground, um, so you don't lose the, the nodules when you dig them up. Um, just moving on. The, the basis for that recommendation of 50 nodules per plant for this particular um, group of EF legumes, so the peas, beans, lentils and vetch, um, can be seen in this, this next slide. Um, it's actually um, uh, some data from 22 different um, field trials and along the x-axis at the bottom you can see nodule number per plant um, and then the amount of fixed M um, per tonne of shoot legume dry matter fixed. And this is real field data, so there's a lot of variation in it, but you can see that there's a, a general relationship. And once you get above 50 nodules per plant, there's a, a higher probability that you'll fix that target of 20 kilos of nitrogen per tonne of dry matter reduced. So that's the reason why we, we recommend um, that 50 nodules per, per plant. So just moving on, how much nitrogen is, is fixed by a legume in the system? Again, this is some work from some 20 um, trials where we've measured end fixation using the natural abundance method in field pea. Um, and it's just a graphic, you can see the little pea on the right hand side of the diagram. Um, it corresponds to the um, the box with the different levels of nitrogen in it. What you, and, and it's nitrogen kilograms per hectare. So above the ground, which are the, the blue boxes, you can see that an, an average pea crop across the 20 trials fixed 100, uh, didn't fix, it contained 132 kilos of nitrogen um, and about 70 of that, that was fixed. Now below ground in the roots, the, the orange boxes, you're, you're getting about 62 kilos of N in total. Um, and above ground, there's about 71 in the grain and 61 in the stubble. So even in a good pea crop, even after you've removed um, the grain harvest and taken that 71 kilos of N away, you're still leaving behind approximately 120 kilos in the stubble and the roots below ground. So these crops are often making larger contributions of nitrogen um, than you might think. Okay, just briefly, I'll touch on some of the um, stresses that can affect the success of inoculation. And I'm gonna briefly touch on three things. Soil acidity, um, dry sowing and seed applied fungicides. So this is just a, a graphic of some data from um, a range of field sites, again, where we've been looking at the nodulation of peas, beans, vetch and lentil in acid soils. So across the bottom axis, you've got soil pH um, measured in calcium chloride. And up the Y axis, the vertical axis, you've got nodulation, nodule number per plant. And you can see that um, the nodulation um, of about 50 nodules is in, in the green line. What you can see is as you, you drop down below um, pH 6 for this particular legume group, um, that you often, uh, or that you see a dramatic um, decrease in, in nodulation. And by pH 4, um, the nodulation is negligible. Um, now I've just got a question come up here. Is the target nodulation rate for lupins around 50 per plant as well? Um, generally, we would think that would be a reasonable number. Lupin nodulation tends to be a little bit harder to define because it tends to be, the nodules tend to be really tightly clustered around the tap, tap root. Um, so they're a little bit more difficult to pick off, but, but certainly in that ballpark would be a good guide. Okay, so I guess the, um, the take home message from this graphic that you're looking at now is that really you want to get your pH up um, um, between five and five and a half to maximise 
um, nodulation of this particular legume group. And by the time you get down to pH 4, um, your nodulation is going to be seriously compromised. Okay, this is just a, a graphic that combines a little bit of data that we've um, from an experiment where we've looked at um, both the impact of dry sowing and um, the impact of the, pest, uh, the fungicide P pickle T, um, which is thiamine and thiabendazole. Um, this is uh, actually a growth room experiment, and um, what we did, we we um, we inoculated um, some um, some mira farba bean. Um, it was put in some uh, a neutral sandy loam soil in a growth room, and then the the, the legume seed um, was pulled out of that soil at various times um, after inoculation to essentially simulate what would happen under a dry sowing scenario. And these soils were maintained at about one or two percent moisture. So this was peat um, applied to the, the seed and that the peat was applied after the, uh, either without pea pickle tea, which is on the left hand side of the graphic, or with pea pickle tea. The peat would have been applied after the pea pickle tea was applied and dried on the seed. Um, so what you see here, so we've got rhizobial cells per seed, and you can see the little dash line of, at 100,000. Now that's the, the standard on a farba bean seed that is recommended for good nodulation, okay? And you can see at the time that the seed is inoculated, we're well above that line, but by three days, uh, seven days later, the purple bar um, would have dropped down um, considerably to just above that line. And by the time we get to 21 days after inoculation, so this is a scenario where you wouldn't have, it's sun dry and you wouldn't have um, rain for three weeks, you've dropped below the threshold. So the general, just looking at that, I guess the take home message there, from what we've seen in uh, this experiment and field trials, that if if you're within a, a week or two of rain, um, then peat um, is quite a good, will still be viable as a way of inoculating your, your legume seed where the plant is responsive to inoculation. The cluster of bars on the, the right hand side of this graphic where the peat is applied with pea pickle tea, you can see that the death rate of the rhizobium on seed is greatly um, increased. And so that's just something to be mind about. If you're going into a dry sowing situa situation um, that is responsive to inoculation, um, then you might want to reconsider um, one, if you apply the fungicide, or two, whether you maybe go from peak to a granule to avoid that, that conflict. Okay, moving on. Um, just a brief chat about inoculation, inoculant formulations and application rate. Um, so you're probably all aware that there's a, a number of um, um, inoculant formulations available. Um, so a survey a couple of years ago indicated that about 82% of growers are still using peat. Um, um, so that is still the dominant application method. Um, for a number of reasons, including it's the most economic way to apply inoculants. Um, we've got a number of granular formulations, which can be um, peat-based or clay-based. We've got the freeze dries product, and for soybean, there's also a, a liquid. I guess um, two points here. Um, the, peat, the peat in our experience always delivers um, a, a good, reliable um, um, amount of nodulation on legumes. Um, so it, it's still our, our go-to formulation, although granules may have applications where, where you're in dry soils for long periods of time or you're trying to avoid incompatibilities with fungicides and fertilisers. The, diff the fundamental difference between peat and granules is the peat is a pure culture and has about uh, a billion rhizobium per gram of peat, whereas the granules um, um, are an unsterile culture and they have about a hundredfold less rhizobium in them. 
And this is why with granules, the application rates are much higher. So you really need to stick to the application rates on the um, different products. The third um, most commonly used formulation is the, the freeze-dried one, which you can see in the little vials. Um, now that is a, they are effectively pure cells, so they're very high counts, but because they're pure and not in peat, um, they are more vulnerable to a lot of stresses. So the freeze-dried inoculants are really only suitable if in, in ideal sowing conditions, so going into a moist soil, and where you can um, apply that inoculant and get it into the soil within hours of the application of the inoculant. Um, you certainly don't want to use the freeze-dried inoculants where um, um, you're going into a dry soil um, or where there's a prolonged, a few days um, between when you might inoculate and when you sow. That's just some general guidelines around those products. Um, just a, a brief uh, comment about inoculation rate. If, if you haven't had a, a legume in, in the paddock previously that's been well nodulated from the, the legume group that you intend to sow, or you're in stressful soil conditions, um, then Almost without exception, increasing your inoculation rate, doubling it, will provide you with some benefit. So the picture you're looking at here is some beans on the bottom of um, Air Peninsula. And this particular drops trial, the pH was 4.4, so very acidic. Um, and the trial was dry for um, 30 days. And what you can see is that um, the plot on the right is one times inoculation rate with peat with the commercial inoculant strain group F. And the plot on the left is two times um, the recommended inoculation rate. So you can see, clearly see the response there. And we see this across multiple trials. So going into stressful soil environments, uh, dry soils, acidic soils, or where the legume hasn't been grown previously, um, increasing your inoculation rate generally is a good strategy. And just to reiterate that, this is just some um, um, work undertaken by Liz Farkaston, um, where we were looking at um, responses to inoculation in dry sowing situations. So the previous slide was being, this slide shows you some data for lupin and chickpea. Um, where it was dry for seven and 18 days respectively. You can see the rate of inoculation on the bottom and you can see nodule number per plant um, on the vertical axis. And you can see a nice response for both the pea and the lupin in, in that scenario. All right, just uh, briefly touching on some of the new developments we're working on. Um, and, and I'll just briefly discuss two of them. We are looking well, we have done a considerable amount of work on the development of an acid tolerant strain for um, the EF rhizobium and more specifically it will probably be recommended for barber bean and lentil um, if the data supports the release of the new strain and we're also developing a soil DNA test for this for this legume group that will allow you to make decisions on whether or not inoculation is needed. Uh, just very briefly send you a little bit of um, cover a little bit of uh, information in those two spaces. So um, again, just some of the strains we're working with. WSM1455 is the current group F inoculant, isolated from the soil at pH 8. Um, the strains that we're working with, 969 for example, which is the, the, um, the one isolated from Riverton in South Australia, comes from a a soil which is 4.7 and so you might expect that to perform better in acid soil situations than one that's come from soil pH 8. Just a little bit of data from um, some 19 trials and this just looks at five measures that we've looked at in those trials, modulation, biomassing, fixation, grain yield and then a summary of all those measures. Um, and it's all standardised to the performance of 1455, which is by definition on the zero line, it's the second column along. 
what you can see, just if we just focus on the nodulation data, the first cluster of um, bars on this graph, you can see that um, compared to 1455, and this is in acid soils, pH 4.7 on average, that where you don't inoculate on those soils, your nodulation is about six, uh, 45 percentage units less than WSM 1455. So the first message here is if you're, if you're using these, this uh, um, inoculation group on, on bean, lentil, pea or vetch, and you're on acid soils below pH 5, inoculation is really important, even with the commercial inoculant strain, and if you can, double the rate up. Um, but what you can see is that if we move to the uh, darker blue bar, um, the third bar in, um, that's, oops, step back to there, um, that's strain 169, and you can see there's a 57% increase in nodulation by that strain. So, and, and similar sort of patterns across the, the other measures. Um, so the likely release date for that strain, if all goes well, it may be next year um, or certainly the year after. So we're, we're about a year away of making a decision on whether we progress that. The other thing I would just point out is that the new strain is only one tool in the toolbox and really we, um, um, we still see that as being used in concert with lining. And the reason for that is shown in the little um, figure of the fava beans um, in your bottom right corner. And you can see that as you, as you decrease um, soil pH, this is fava beans growing in hydroponic from five on the left hand to four on the right. It has dramatic impact, impacts on the bean roots. Um, so we can give you the best strain in the world um, but if, you, if your pH is, is significantly below five, the, the legume itself is going to be impacted in terms of its root growth in the acid soils. So we see the, the new strain of rhizobium when it is released still being used in concert with the lining strategy. Okay, so just moving to the last part of this presentation. Um, this is about the development of a DNA test that we're undertaking here at SARDI. This is again for the EF rhizobium group, um, which modulate the um, bean, lentil, pea, and vetch. And um, just to summarise that data, where we're looking at this test um, as a, it will be delivered on the um, predictor B um, um, root disease test platform um, if, if the test um, proves to be viable. Um, and it will, it will allow you to understand the numbers of rhizobium in your soil um, prior to sowing the legume crop and therefore to make an informed decision on whether you do or do not need to inoculate based on the probability of likelihood of response. And this is just a tiny bit of data. It just shows you the blue bars are the DNA of the EF rhizobium detected in 13 samples at three sites. And you can see it's picking up about 25,000 um, rhizobium per gram of soil. And that's what we would expect in these particular paddocks that were assessed. And the red bars are just the, um, the estimate determined by a plant bioassay, which is a much more tedious me method. So you can see the sort of some general agreement between the DNA test and the plant bioassay. But in fact, the DNA test is providing us with tighter data at each of these sites and is in line with our expectation with what would be in the soil. So that's uh, very encouraging. We've also done a little bit of work sampling on and off row um, this year. Um, and this is just some data for 27 paired sample on and off row. Um, you can see that the copies of rhizobium DNA off row are 20,511 rhizobium per gram of soil, or equivalent to, and on row a little bit higher, but not statistically significant. So, so down the track, um, when you sample paddocks um, for this assay, we'll, we will recommend that you go off row um, because that provides a reasonable predictor of the level of rhizobium in the soil. Just the last slide. Um, so regarding that uh, DNA testing, 
We're currently um, looking at developing some calibrations between the DNA test and the plant bioassays and also understanding the capacity of the rhizobium in the soil to fix nitrogen. It's really important that we do this calibration work um, before we re release the test, just to ensure that we don't make any recommendations um, not to inoculate, and then there are issues with nodulation. So we want to be absolutely confident um, that the DNA test is a good predictor of the rhizobium number in soil. Again, if this work goes to plan and it's going very well at this stage, then we anticipate there'll be a limited release of the EF um, test on the Predictor B soil test platform um, at the end of this year, so for next season, uh, the season after that, the, the one immediately before us. Um, and that brings to the end uh, my presentation for today. Excellent, thank you very much for us. Now we have time for a couple of questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please click, click on the Q&A button down the bottom of your screen and you can type your question there. So um, there's a question come in from uh, Rock and Broad. Uh, would you anticipate the new acetone strain to be equally effective in neutral soils versus the current strain? So I guess the answer to that is um, yes. The the um, evaluation of the strain has been evaluated or, or been across a range of environments that have included some um, alkaline soils and it's performed adequately in those environments also. We also do our quite a lot of glasshouse testing to assure that the end fixation capacity of the strain is adequate. I guess the other um, modifying answer to that question might be that um, once you move into neutral and alkaline soils, you're gonna have significant population um, populations of um, rhizobium in them. So they will be less responsive. So we are, deliberately targeting the more acid end of the spectrum because that's where we see the inoculation responses will be more likely. Okay, um, do the rough guides given for EF inoculum also hold for chickpea inoculum? <clears throat> so in terms of um, um, nodulation, um, we generally see less nodules on, on chickpea, so we're more around about the 30 per plant, um, but our data sets aren't, um, aren't as um, comprehensive as what we have for pea and bean, but our experience would tell us that the, that the, not, the numbers are uh, slightly less for chickpea in terms of what you should be targeting. Um, in terms of other aspects of chickpea inoculant, so um, um, does doubling the inoculation rate um, improve nodulation? Well, the answer to that is yes. And because chickpea rhizobium are much less widely distributed in soils, um, it's important that uh, inoculation is done well and there will be benefits from, you know, in a lot of situations from upping the inoculation rate. Um, um, we've got time probably for one more question. Okay. Did nodulation decrease over the 21 days from the coloured column slide peat versus pea pickle tea? Um, okay, so this is a question about um, the slide. I'll just flip back to that. So, <coughs> um, questions about this slide. So look, we didn't um, carry this through to a nodulation assessment. Um, however, um, in other, um, other experiments where we have looked at um, um, the impacts of uh, nodulation following the application of fungicide, um, nodulation is decreased 
um, in line with the reductions in, in rhizobial numbers. All right, so if you're looking for any further information on pulses, GRDC's Grow Notes are a very comprehensive resource. And also we had the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project, which has a number of activities occurring during 2020, which will bring you the latest pulse information. Also a network of discussion groups across Victoria and South Australia for existing and new pulse growers. If you have any other suggestions or requests for things you'd like to learn about, please let Claire know. The best contact for her is her email, claire at bcg.org.au. We have three more webinars coming up next week, commencing on March 16th, so keep your eyes out for that. So thank you again to Ross for a great presentation. Once you have left the webinar, you will be redirected to a screen with a quick survey. It has five questions and should take you no more than a minute just to see how you found today. If you can fill that out, that would be very much appreciated and will help us to continue to bring you these Pulse webinars. If you would like to be kept in the loop of when these webinars are occurring, please again contact Claire and she can send you an email when they're coming up. Again, her email is claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, -E, at bcg.org.au. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you again, Ross. Thank you.